As many of you are probably aware, this is my main workbench, and I've been using it since before YouTube, about eight years or so. Uh, I built this workbench as well as the other one, and they're built exactly the same, mostly out of two by fours. They're six feet long by three feet wide. It's great, except for there's one problem, and that's that it doesn't have any work holding or fixturing. I, I don't have a vise on the end of it. I don't have any dog holes or T-track. As I've gotten better as a woodworker, I've found that I've wanted that. So that's what I wanna do this week is I want to add some vices and some other work holding to this workbench and take a workbench that's already great and make it even better. <laughs> I picked up a couple of vices from Rockler. This is generally what's called an end vise, and this is called a front vise, and that's because on a traditional workbench, this would go on the front and this one would go on the end. The only thing is I am not building a traditional workbench. I still work with a lot of power tools. I want a, a flat assembly surface. So two thirds of this is gonna be devoted to flat assembly and then one third will be like a traditional workbench. And in order to accomplish that, I'm gonna actually rotate the front vise over to this side and put the end vise over here. And that way I'll address it this way and it'll kind of act like a traditional workbench. Now I don't actually remember how I built this, so we're gonna have to investigate. Can't remember what's glued on or what's just nailed on. So I think I'm actually just gonna have to attack this with a pry bar and maybe a saw to get these sides off so I can figure out what the structure is like underneath. I have this vague recollection that when I built this workbench, I intended it to be able to take apart completely with screws. But then as I was building it, I sort of forgot that plan and started gluing parts on. As a result, this thing is a mixture of glue and screws. Fortunately, I didn't glue like with a lot of glue, so things came off relatively easily. Nice. One nice thing about tearing this thing apart is you can kind of see how it was built. My intention for this was sort of like a poor man's torsion box. It's built with two by fours that are cut out using a circular saw with half lap joinery. I also ripped the sides off of it so there aren't rounded edges. They're actually three inches as opposed to three and a half inches. And I glued plywood on both sides, which makes it a lot more stable. In other words, it's a super strong table made out of really affordable materials. And for those of you who are curious, you'd want to build one of these in your own shop. I do have plans available on my store. It's omfab.com slash plans. And you can either buy the plans for the basic DIY version or the more advanced version that I'm building in this video. Even though this plywood helps with the structure of the workbench, it became pretty apparent that I had to cut into two of the six bays in order to make room for the hardware for the vices and so that I could reinforce the bottom for the dog holes. These vices that I chose are the Rockler quick release vices and they open up after a quarter turn so you don't have to keep turning it to, to loosen the vise. In order to install it though, I am going to have to take it apart a little bit. So I've removed this plate, which is the plate that mounts the vise to the table. Uh, and there's a couple issues. I need it to go a little bit higher. It's a little bit too far down. And I also, uh, this is only the thickness of a two by four and I need more more meat here for it to, to grab onto. So I am actually gonna <laughs> glue a board back in here uh, like the one that I removed before. I'm just gonna use a piece of denser wood. I've got some poplar here that I, I can glue and bolt on and then I can bolt this up to that. To get that edge of the workbench wide enough, I actually glued in a second board behind inside of the cubby. And then I can use both of those as reference faces to cut in and flatten that center piece. This was easily accomplished with a multi-tool.
Now the wood glue alone was probably strong enough to hold this, but just in case I added a couple structural screws between the three boards for good measure. Now, one thing that I realized is that when I lined up the screw holes for the plate is that the back screw hole was right on the seam between two of the boards. So I decided to scoot it back a little bit, but before I did that, I wanted to make sure and mark where the holes are relative to the tabletop. So when I go to actually make the jaws, I know exactly where to drill out the holes. I set that piece of paper aside and then lined up the jaws. Again, I'm trying to avoid that seam in the back. Once I was happy with where it was placed, I could pre-drill the holes and mount it with some lag screws. So the boards that I'm gonna be wrapping the outside of the workbench with are alder. I like alder because it's pretty affordable. Uh, it's grown out here in Washington State and it's also a, a pretty soft wood, which I like for the outside rails on a workbench because personally, I would rather dent the side of my workbench than dent the side of a piece of furniture that I've spent a lot of time on. These are also gonna be slightly taller than the original sides that I had on the workbench. I need it to be tall enough to cover up the hardware for the vise. I also want to add T-Track into some of these sides, so having a little bit more depth gives me more room for that track. The two sides that are getting vices actually need even more depth because I need to account for the screws in the vise. I glued on a board that was larger than what I needed and I can cut off the excess later, but first I want to set up for the holes that I need to drill on the side of it. This is where that sheet of paper is going to come in handy, the one that I traced the holes on previously. This is a little geometry trick that I found out that you can actually draw two lines. They're pretty arbitrary as long as they intersect on the edge of the circle. And then you use a set of dividers that's wider than halfway of those lines. And then you draw an arc from all three of the points that intersect the outside of the circle. That results in a couple of these like eye shapes. And then if you connect those two eye shapes together, they intersect at the, the center of that circle. I, I know this may sound or look a little bit complicated, but I promise once you've done it a couple times, it's pretty, pretty intuitive. And I'll post a video down below that explains it in a little bit more detail. I temporarily clamped on the sideboard and I left it a little bit long on one side so that I can cut that away later. And then using the center mark that I found earlier, I marked that on the board and could use that piece of paper that I just made to mark off the center points of those circles that I need to drill out. With the holes drilled out, I could check my fit and it was looking good. So I decided to mark for the excess that I'm gonna trim off. I want the boards to match all the way around. So I just went with this sort of angled cut underneath. You're not gonna see this only when the vise is open, but uh, it's something that I'll, I'll notice. So I wanted it to look nice. I trimmed off the majority of it using the table saw just to get those straight lines. And then to do the angled cuts, I used my bandsaw. That sideboard is gonna form the inside of the vise and for the outer jaw of the vise, I'm gonna be using this cherry. I don't use a lot of cherry in my shop. I'm really not that familiar with it, but it is pretty affordable right now and uh, it's a pretty hard wood. It's kind of in that nice middle zone between hard and soft, which for vise jaws, I think is perfect. You don't want it to be super hard to crush your material, but you also want it to stand up over time. Using the sideboard and the drill bit that I used to drill it out, I marked the holes in the jaw and then brought that over to the drill press to drill that piece out.
I knew that I'd have to test the fit on these several times, so I decided to chamfer the inside of the holes just to protect the grain so it doesn't accidentally tear out. And then I can check to see how things are lining up. The weather is getting nicer out here in Seattle, and that means it's another perfect time to go exploring with this week's sponsor, Jackery. For months, I've been traveling to some of my favorite locations in Washington and bringing my Jackery solar power generators with me. I've used them to light outdoor photo shoots, boil water while camping. I even did some power carving on the beach. This week, I decided to take my Jackery to a local park and enjoy the Northwest views. I'm a big fan of keeping my Explorer 1000 in the trunk of old gold, so no matter where I am, my devices are fully charged. The Explorer 1000 is super portable, so I can take it to remote locations, and there's plenty of power to last several days. If I do need more power, I can easily recharge the unit using Jackery's portable solar panels. I have a pair of Solar Saga 100s, which quickly unfold and have integrated kickstands, so you can set them up in seconds. Jackery offers a number of different models so you can pick what size battery works best for you. The bigger the battery, the more kinds of devices you can power. I recently added the all new 1500 Pro to my collection. I keep this one in the house as a backup in case of power outages. The 1500 Pro inverter is capable of producing 1800 watts of pure sine wave power with a peak output of 3600 watts. With this massive inverter, the Jackery 1500 Pro has few limitations and is capable of powering most all of the tools in my wood shop. Jackery solar generators are super safe and durable with an intelligent battery management system, temperature sensors to prevent overheating, and a fireproof outer shell. It can easily withstand drops and bumps whether you're outdoors or on the job site. Right now, Jackery has a huge sale for Earth Day from now through April 22nd. If you follow the links in the description below, you can save up to 25% off. Don't miss this chance to snag one for your spring getaway. Thanks, Jackery. Now back to the build. I should mention that the holes that I drilled were a drill bit size larger than the holes that I need. And I use that so that I have some slack. I don't want this thing to accidentally tighten up and bind over time. So having a little bit of extra slack on these is a good thing. Once I had it in position, I could clamp it down and then add the four screws into it, setting the location of the jaw. Like I said, there is a lot of assembly and disassembly in installing this vise. So I immediately took the jaw off the vise to add a couple of details. I decided to add a round over to the side of the jaw because I thought it would help it look a little bit lighter and it's also going to protect it a bit from chipping and damage on the corners. I also raised the bit up a little more than usual so it gave a squared edge which I think looks pretty nice. Off camera, I gave the vise a couple of tests and what I realized was that that gap that I put behind the mounting plate was starting to cause problems. Actually, when I compressed the vise, you, you could hear the sides crack and it was distorting a little bit. So I decided to cut a thin strip of alder to put behind there. It was then really easy to double stick tape it onto the surface, drill out the holes and reinstall. I wanted to get the first vise under my belt before tackling the second one because the second one is bigger, it uses more material, and I was worried if I messed it up that it would be a much harder thing to fix. But uh, I felt pretty confident after the first one that I could handle the second one. So I cleaned up those outside edges once again, and then I prepped for the bottom plate for the, the second vise. This also needed some stuff glued in from underneath for, for reinforcement, but it was honestly a little bit easier because what I could do is just rip down a four x four post and glue it in from the back. 
This one's a little bit easier because I'm, first of all, I'm mounting it lower so I don't have to cut away that two by four in the front. It also doesn't have a front lip so I don't have to glue anything extra on the face of this. I just screw it in and it's ready to go. I could remove the bottom plate from the assembly and this is all gonna look very similar to the last one. But again, this one turned out to be easier because the four x four post didn't have any seams in it. So I could mount it flush with the face of the table. Having that plate flush also meant that I didn't need to make a template. I could take the side, clamp it on, and trace the holes from the back. As with the other side, I left this one long and trimmed off the excess that I needed using the table saw and the bandsaw. One of the major differences, however, on this side is that I want to include some T-Track. The remaining three sides will all get this T-Track and to make it, I'm using a three quarter inch straight cutting bit in my router table. The jaws on this side are also going to be a bit different because the vice screws are so much lower on this I wanted to add a bit more heft to the vice jaws So I'm still using that same cherry except for I'm ripping strips of it And I'm gonna glue them up sort of like you would glue up an edge grain cutting board One thing you may notice is I have not replaced the top on this workbench. I love this worktop. It's black melamine and the best part about the black melamine is nothing sticks to it. With the second jaw out of the clamps, I can clean off all the glue squeeze out with a sander and then flatten it on my thickness planer. I squared off the ends, marked the holes, and drilled them out. It was now time to install all of the sides on the outside of the workbench. And I am gonna glue these on just so that they stay flat, but I'm not coating them in glue. So if I do wanna pry them off, I can pry them off in the same exact way as I pried off the old ones last time. The other two side pieces are pretty straightforward. They're just four inch strips of alder that have the T-Track dadoed into them. Now, in order for the T-Track to work around these corners, I need to cut some relief notches. And for that, I take it over to my table saw and cut them out using a crosscut sled. I got the T-Track from Rockler and this comes in four foot and three foot lengths. It may come in two foot lengths. They're pretty much whole measurements. So I designed this side to be four feet, but the other two sides are gonna need to be cut down to length. So I inserted a four foot length into one side and then added a three foot length and then I cut that down on the chop saw. inserted that end and then I can measure out for the other end. Now there's no, as far as I can tell, no like corner piece that you can buy for T-Track. So I, I just cut the ends raw and uh, added a bit of blue Sharpie to match the anodization that's on the aluminum. 
It's pretty critical to line these up so they don't overlap each other so that the T-Track components can slot in and out as they need to. The cool thing about T-Track is you can use it however you want. There's loads of different th things that you can buy, parts that you can buy. I've got a little accessory set from Rockler to build your own jigs. And this comes with star knobs and T-bolts. So that all inserts and you can make jigs like this. This is a pretty simple one. It's flush in the up position and it, it sits a little bit proud in the upside down position. And that works really well as a plane stop. With all four sides permanently attached to the table, I can now focus on tuning the vice jaws. These were not perfect when I first installed them. The big jaw sort of had a gap on the left side and a big gap at the top versus the bottom. These gaps need to be corrected, otherwise the vise won't work super well, especially for thin materials, and it's pretty easy to fix the problem. For the big jaw, the main problem was that gap at the top. And in order to repair that, I loosened up the lag screws and then I could insert some shims at the back. I'm guessing that the reason for this discrepancy is because of that block that I glued in probably wasn't perfectly planed to the existing two x four on the outside of the table, but it really wasn't a big deal. And once it was tightened up, that fixed the problem. Also, there was enough play in those bolts that as I was tightening it, I was kind of mindful to twist it a little bit closer on the left hand side. And as you can see, that gap is pretty much gone. The smaller vise also had an issue, but this was a little bit different. It was pretty gappy on the right hand side and the only way that I could figure out how to fix that was to plane it out. So I drew a line parallel with the outside of the table, removed the jaw and got to use the big vise for the first time. So I'm very new to hand tool woodworking, but it's something that I've always wanted to explore. I, I think I will always be a power tool woodworker, but I, I'm learning and uh, really enjoying that this is something that I, I couldn't really do on power tools, but it's something that I could solve really quickly with hand tools. So this really illustrates why I'm putting vices on this workbench at all. It's so that I can grow as a woodworker and become better at my craft. When attaching the sides and the vice jaws to the tabletop, I left them intentionally a little bit proud so that I could trim them down later. And I was gonna use a templating bit on a router, but since I had the hand plane all tuned up, I decided to try my hand at getting these flush with the hand plane. I have to say it was pretty darn satisfying. One thing I found out is that using a ruler to find any high spots was a really effective strategy to get this nice and level. Since the workbench was starting to look so pretty, I decided to personalize it a little bit. I just recently got the new plate for my Shaper Origin and it is awesome. It's so easy to set up and it's great for adding little details to projects like this. I'm of course engraving my logo into both of these vice jaws and Origin with a V cutting bit made short work of it.
The next phase in this project is to start drilling holes for the dogs. And I'm gonna be drilling holes both in the tops of the jaws as well as the tabletop. And I've done a rough layout here. This is the layout of the structure that's underneath everything that I've added, some of the structure for the vices themselves. When considering the, the spacing of these dogs, it's kind of a juggling act because uh, you don't want them to exceed the depth of the jaw itself. So this is about six and a half inches from here to here. If these are greater than that number, then, uh, then your spacing is off and you won't be able to hold certain sized boards. I'm running into some issues already. There are some bolts in inconvenient spots. Still working on it, but as soon as I figure that out, I can start drilling holes. Felt like it was a good idea to drill a holes in the vices first and then drill a holes in the table. That way I can double check my measurements, make sure that they're right and, uh, and fit everything to the vices. Once I knew the positions of all of the holes, I then went over the top of them with a scratch all just to ensure that if the tape moved or anything happened while I was drilling, I knew exactly where to add them. I also made a last minute decision to reinforce the bottom. I felt like a quarter inch of melamine plus three quarters of plywood wasn't quite enough. So I cut a couple more three quarter inch plywood panels to make it more robust. In order to drill out the tabletop, I obviously can't use my drill press here. And fortunately I have one of these Rockler portable drill guides and I I haven't had a lot of chances to use this, but for this situation, I'm not sure what else I could have used to make these perfectly straight holes. To protect the dog holes from moisture, I added a bit of polyurethane to the insides. And to protect the jaws and the workpiece that I'll be putting into the jaws, I use this stuff called Crubber. It's a cork and rubber mix. I'll post a link down below to where you can find it. On the vice jaws themselves, I used this Bumble Shoots Shop Wax. I've been using this a lot around my shop lately. It's a great beeswax based wax, which is fantastic to use. It smells great. It's non-toxic and it looks good too. And with that, it's finally time to put all this together and start using it. This thing is great. <laughs> it's just like, it's it's kind of the same workbench that I've been used to and I really love that, but it's added so many capabilities to it that I didn't have before. Uh, the T-Track alone is big for me. The like, the fact that I can build accessories to go on here. Eventually I wanna build a sliding dead man on this side uh, to go along with this vise and some extra cabinets around. Um, but I, I'm just excited to share all the capabilities in upcoming videos. 
If you would like to build one of these for your own shop, I have two sets of plans on the website. One is the DIY friendly version with basic tools, basically how I built this originally, because uh, when I built this, I, I, I didn't have many tools. Then there is the second version of it, which is the which is this version of it, the more advanced version. And that is currently in pre-sale. Uh, we're starting to do that now for, for new plans, uh, is that we're doing pre-sales when the videos come out, because in the past I've killed myself to try and get the plans done on time, or I haven't gotten the plans out and I've said check back in a couple weeks and neither system works very well. Instead, we're doing pre-sales now, so uh, those are discounted. So you can get the plans for cheaper and they'll show up in your inbox in a couple of weeks. Thanks so much. Thank you to Jackery for sponsoring this video. Thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys are the best and I'll catch you on the next one.